Good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining us tonight. It is my great pleasure on behalf of 412,123, that's 412,123 living alumni around the world, welcoming you to our program this evening, Evaluating Risk and Building Resilience, Preparing LA for the Big One. How many of you are from LA? All right, yes. Yeah, I'm from, that's a very loose term. <laughs> 24 years ago, Angelinos were jolted awake in the early morning hours of January 17, 1994, when the Northridge earthquake, which was actually based in Reseda, for those of you familiar with the San Fernando Valley, when it rocked Southern California, but Northridge is getting credit for it. The 6.7 magnitude quake claimed the lives of at least 57 people, left thousands injured, and caused property damage estimated to be anywhere between 15 and $50 billion. How many of you remember the Whittier Narrows quake of 87? I was a senior in high school, yeah. How many of you remember the Silmar quake of 71? I was six months old, but yeah, so there's been a lot. Yet, going back to 94, the Northridge earthquake was not even the big one, neither were any of the others I mentioned. The mega earthquake, which seismologists say is inevitable. The question is, will LA's high rises withstand a tremor registering between 7.5 and 8.2 on the Richter scale? Tonight, we're gonna to hear from the director of the Southern California Earthquake Center, along with a panel of industry experts who will share their research and strategies to earthquake-proof Los Angeles before the next time we need to drop, cover, and hold on. Excuse me. Before we begin our program, I want to recognize the members of the USC Alumni Association's Board of Governors who are here with us in attendance tonight. I'm going to ask them uh, to stand as I call their names and remain standing to be recognized as a group, so please hold your raucous applause until all have been introduced. The Board of Governors members who are here tonight are Craig Farkas, Michael Lowe, Annie Acapinti, Meg Palisok, Shane Swordlow, and Kev Zorian. Ladies and gentlemen, our USC Alumni Association Board of Governors. We're also joined tonight by our Assistant Vice President for Alumni Relations. Please welcome Danielle Harvey Stinson. I'd also like to take this opportunity to acknowledge and thank our partners for tonight's event. Uh, we have several folks who have collaborated with the Alumni Association to put this program together, including the support of Alliance, uh, Alliant Insurance Services, the USC Dornsife College of Letters, Arts, and Sciences, the USC Price School of Public Policy's Alumni Association, the USC Alumni Real Estate Network, and the Southern California Earthquake Center. Please give all these partners a round of applause. Thank you. And now I'm honored to introduce our keynote speaker for tonight's program. John Vidali is a Dean's Professor at USC and is the Director of the Southern California Earthquake Center. He is a member of the National Academy of Science and has received numerous honors for his research, which focuses on earthquakes, earth structure, volcanoes, and the hazards of strong shaking. <clears throat> Excuse me. Prior to joining USC in 2017, John served as a professor at the University of Washington, the director of the Pacific Northwest Seismic Network, and as the Washington State Seismologist. And I was talking to John before the program, and he told me this is his third try in Southern California. He got his PhD at Caltech, then he went to UCLA and taught for 10 years, but now he's back in Southern California at the best university in the land uh, at USC. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in a warm welcome for John Vidali. So I just want to give a background so we understand uh, what's happening here with the earthquake in Southern California, and also describe what our earthquake center does. So we have the Southern California Earthquake Center, which we call SCEC. Um, it was founded in 1991 by Kay Aki. Uh, he defined uh, the center to try to find the master model to predict the, earth, the occurrence of earthquakes on the basis of geophysical observables, just as the weathermen forecast the weather, effectively. So that's what we're trying to do. Um, and I should mention Tom Jordan has run it for about the past 15 years uh, until I took it over uh, last year, uh, as uh, you heard coming from the University of Washington. Oh, and I also wanted to mention that we're housed in Zumberg Hall, the, uh, one of the prettiest buildings on campus, kind of the last one as you head over to the Coliseum to watch the, uh, I hope, very successful football team. Uh, so far, so good. Um, so I want to quickly, just to make sure everyone understands that earthquakes, uh, and the earthquakes are driven by plate tectonics, and plate tonic, tectonics are driven because the earth, when it formed four and a half billion years ago, formed hot, it formed hot because from colliding uh, planetesimals that ran into each other 10 or 15 kilometers a second. 
And it was uh, hot enough that the iron uh, mostly melted to the center, so we currently have an uh, iron core, molten for the most part with a small iron, solid, uh, solid iron center. But we're more concerned with the rocky part of the Earth. So roughly the outer half of the Earth is rocks, the crust and mantle technically. And because it's hot and space is cold, it's letting the heat out, and it's letting the heat out just like a pot on the stove. The material is convecting. So the cold material is sinking, the warm material is rising. That's mainly what's happening. But up on the surface of the Earth where it's cold, it forms a brittle crust, and this crust breaks into the tectonic plates. So this cartoon, whoops, better hit the right button here, roughly breaks into tectonic plates, and they're shifting around as the mantle underneath is convecting. And so they move um, on the order of an inch a year. Okay, so that's very slow. It takes about 100 million years for one overturn of the mantle. But where this crust is shifting is where we have earthquakes. Okay, as the plates shift, they stick, and then they hold for a year or 10 years or a century or a millennium, and then the stress builds up to where it can't take it anymore, and they break in earthquakes. So that's the basic engine we have driving our plates. And here in the western uh, U.S., we have a plate boundary on the North American plate where it meets the Pacific plate off to the edge with a little Juan de Fuca plate stuck between the Pacific Northwest and the Pacific plate. And this boundary has the Pacific plate moving north at about an inch a year compared to North America. And it's this motion, and it's not just a single crack, it's a whole, oops, whole system of cracks that um, form the San Andreas Fault system. That's basically why we have earthquakes here in uh, California. Okay. Um, oh, and I have one more thing I meant to mention on this. And the San Andreas Fault is the best understood fault system in the world. It's essentially because not only can we see it very clearly with the deserts in California, but also we have 10 of the world's best universities right on top of it, and we had the 1906 earthquake that caught our attention. So this is kind of the world's leading place to understand earthquakes. And this is how the risk of shaking is distributed across the country. You know, there are a few earthquakes we don't understand all that well in New Madrid. There was one in Charleston about 100 years ago, some mysterious seismicity up here. But most of the actions right on the San Andreas and the Cascadia faults on the West Coast. There's a bit of action on the Wasatch Fault Zone, about a tenth as much as there is on the West Coast. So, but the point really is that um, these earthquakes are expensive. If we look, if we ask FEMA, they say it costs about $5 billion a year to fix the damage caused by earthquakes. So most years there's almost no damage, and every so often there's 50 billion, 100 billion, even $200 billion damage in the big earthquakes. So we work very hard to make the world safer for earthquakes. Uh, and Half that exposure is in Southern California, and that's why USC has uh, basically the country's earthquake center. And as, as an aside, when I was starting to try to fit, pick uh, where I was going to work, I was interested in physics, but it was getting kind of tedious, a problem set a week. Um, but right about then, we thought we were about to predict earthquakes. And does anyone remember the Palmdale Bulge? Yeah. So. Right in the mid-70s, people thought the uh, Mojave Desert, this little contours, here's the coastline, um, they thought it was lifting up about half a foot or a foot, and they thought this was the sign of the San Andreas cracking and getting close to failing in a magnitude 8 earthquake that would uh, badly damage Los Angeles. Um, uh, luckily for us, that was wrong, um, so the Palmdale Bulge. Um, but, you know, it made the cover of Time magazine and people were saying five or ten years, we'd know ahead of time when the earthquakes were coming. But we've been going back and using what we call a kind of brick by brick approach rather than the silver bullet approach. Instead of thinking we can predict an earthquake, we're trying to measure the hazard accurately. And that's what we've been doing kind of ever since. Um, so SCEC is uh, an organization where we have about 70 institutions coordinated by USC. We give out 100 grants to do specific projects to understand the fault systems. Uh, every year we have a meeting in Palm Springs. Once again this year it was 110 degrees, so we all stayed <laughs> inside and talked about earthquakes. And, um, and so that's, a, that's our, our annual, annual meeting. And we, with SCEC, we try to understand the basic science of earthquakes. What are the mechanics of earthquakes? What's the geology? All those things. 
because we need those building blocks. But then SCEC builds a model of the fault system. It, it, we find all the faults in California. We try to map out how the waves travel through California. We try to map the mineralogy. We try to map the properties of the rocks and how it flows as it's stressed. Uh, so California is the most detailed, uh, is the area with the best maps uh, worldwide as well. Um, we have a center we call a center for the study of earthquake predictability. That's something where we look at the patterns of earthquakes and try and tell what can we tell from swarms of earthquakes and if there's a big earthquake, what kind of aftershocks are likely to follow. And it's centered at USC, but it's got an international component. There are branches in Japan and China and New Zealand and Europe. So again, we're trying to understand what we can say about the likelihood of earthquakes. And it's not nearly what we thought we could in the 70s, but what we can figure out is what that's the results of the center. Uh, we also uh, coordinate uh, the shakeout. You probably notice every year there's information distributed around the state of uh, a scenario earthquake and what it would mean in terms of impact and what we should do to prepare. I'll have that in the next slide in a little more detail. Um, but first, I wanted to mention a few myths, just to kind of prepare, make this a little bit practical. I assume nobody here thinks California is going to fall into the ocean. You know, as I said, the tectonic plates move an inch a year. There's an earthquake every few hundred years. The ground moves a couple of feet, 20 feet at the most on the big faults uh, in California when there's an earthquake. So it's not going to fall in the ocean. There is a story that earthquakes happen in the morning when it's hot, dry weather. That's because a lot of the earthquakes in the past have occurred then. But we understand earthquakes well enough to know that the faults really don't care what the weather is at the top. Um, that's just a coincidence, and at least that's our story, and I hope it doesn't, the pattern doesn't continue. Um, this one we hear about every month. That scientists, they we know how to predict earthquakes. We don't want to cause a panic. You know, they're stockpiling body bags, and we all have our plane tickets to get out of town. <laughs> uh, but you know, as I've already said, it's just not true. You know, we're, we have only a vague idea, and, the, and basically the danger is the same every day as the next day. Uh, it's not changing, and we, we aren't hiding it. So that they're more complicated myths, like you know, if people say my building was built to code so it's earthquake proof, and again, that's not good enough. You'd still need to know about earthquakes and be looking out because codes have improved over time. Things aren't always built to code. Buildings sometimes don't maintain their integrity over the decades, uh, so that's an oversimplification. And then we deal with the idea, it just won't happen here in my lifetime. And this is complicated because the big earthquakes are infrequent. For all we know, there may not be a big earthquake for 50 years, or it may be tomorrow. But you know, the fact is, it's a lot less expensive to prepare for earthquakes than it is to fix things afterwards. And so it's well worth being prepared for earthquakes. Uh, people say they've felt a Northridge earthquake, for example, and so they know what an earthquake's like and their house is safe. But Northridge was not a big earthquake. A big earthquake is a magnitude 8 in California. Northridge is a magnitude 7. And in any case, each earthquake has a somewhat different pattern of shaking. So just from feeling one earthquake doesn't mean your worries are over either. Um, so kind of back to Skek, uh, the original shakeout scenario was uh, 2008. So we did a scenario to figure out what would happen if we had a big earthquake on the San Andreas Fault with simulating the wave propagation and the damage to the structures. And what we found is, you know, it's fairly likely to have lots of aftershocks. It would generate tens of thousands of landslides. There'd be a lot of fires if it happened in the wrong season. Um, the cost could be hundreds of billions of dollars. There'd be hundreds of thousands of buildings impacted, homeless people, uh, injuries, deaths, recovery. Um, okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. So we're so let me see. So the result of this exercise is that we uh, realized the state wasn't prepared. They wrote a report in the city and um, the, uh, spent billions of dollars in preparing the city better. Um, we've done a lot of simulations to study how the earthquakes work. I'll just start this one. I won't finish it for limitations of time. But this one ran for about a week on a supercomputer. And this is the kind of thing we tell to try to figure out the pattern of damage in the big earthquakes. Uh, and what you're looking at are the vibrations coming out of the Earth. And for the earthquake, and the San Andreas is ripping right to left toward Los Angeles. 
And simulations like this showed us what we didn't really expect, which was that the valleys coming off the San Andreas can funnel energy right into downtown. So the long periods that resonate big buildings, we're realizing now may be about twice as strong as people had thought because of effects like this setting the basins to resonating. So I could show, I could watch this for hours, but I... <laughs> <laughs> And we made the latest faulting model. This is the two to 300 segments of faults that are in California. It's a USURF stands for Uniform California Earthquake Rupture Forecast. That's really the basis of the hazard estimates people use to build from, and it tells us how often earthquakes of different sizes occur. Um, and then I just wanted to do a quick tour of the PAC-12, and <laughs> I won't get into the numbers here, but the worst is the Bay Area. You can see that Stanford is right on the uh, San Andreas and Berkeley is right on the Hayward Fault. Um, in fact, you may know that the Hayward Fault runs right through the Berkeley Stadium. Um, so it keeps the Berkeley engineers busy figuring out how that works. Um, and Los Angeles is full of faults too. So the motions are maybe 70 to 80 percent as high when we look at what we need to expect for buildings. It's still quite high. Uh, medium risk is the Oregon and Washington universities near the coast, near the big earthquake on the coast, and Utah right on the Wasatch Fault. And if you're really afraid of earthquakes, uh, Wazoo's pretty safe, eastern Washington, Arizona's safe, and Colorado, even though it's on the Rocky Mountain front, uh, still is much lower uh, danger than the top eight. Just a quick review. So just to finish, uh, you know, we're looking at a lot of challenges with the earthquake center. You know, one thing is we're trying to figure out how the plate boundary works over years to thousands of years to millions of years. It's a complicated system deep into the earth. We're trying to figure out how earthquakes break, and that involves milliseconds to minutes of uh, cracks running through the ground. We're trying to figure out how the cities shake, uh, how much and how often. And then we're trying to figure out what to do with that information. So this is just a brief review of the very wide range of things we do at the Earthquake Center. Um, I wanted to just give a little thanks to PG&E, also State Farm. Uh, we have a number of sponsors of SCEC. Uh, NSF and the USGS support us uh, quite a bit as well. And uh, that's it, I'm done. Well, I do have a question. How many of us are going to move next week? <laughs> Kidding. All right. John, thank you very much for that fascinating presentation. Let's once again give him a round of applause for all his great work. I'm proud to have you uh, at the Southern California Earthquake Center. That's another point of pride for our great university. Now I'd like to introduce our guest for tonight's panel discussion. Please hold your applause until all have been introduced. Our first panelist is Marissa Ajo. She's a USC Price alum who serves as the Chief Resilience Officer in the Office of the Los Angeles Mayor, Eric Garcetti, where she leads citywide resiliency efforts. Actually, let's, let's clap for her. So Marissa. <laughs> Come on down, you're the next contestant on the USC alumni program. <laughs> our next panelist, our next contestant, Christine Goulet, is an expert in the field of geotechnical earthquake engineering and applied seismology with a focus on site response, ground motion modeling, and seismic hazard analysis. Christine, please come on up, or come on down. <laughs> Mark Humphreys is the Vice President of Litigation and Risk Management at Watt Investment Partners, where he is responsible for overall risk management, as well as acquisition and maintenance of all insurance for the company's widespread ventures. Mark Humphreys. And finally, another Price alum. Tonight we have Ryan Arba. He is the moderator for tonight's discussion. And Ryan uh, is the branch chief for California Governor's Office of Emergency Services Earthquake and Tsunami Program. Ryan, please come on up. And take us away. Thank you guys very much. We heard a lot about the, the threats. Um, we're in earthquake country. Um, and we've got a, a, such a diverse group of folks here on our panel tonight. Um, that work in one form or another with that threat. What keeps you up at night? <laughs> Let's start with Marissa. Nothing, because I'm tired. <laughs> it's fine. Um, you know, so, so thank you again for having me. Um, you know, Mayor Garcetti, uh, the boss, um, has been invested in resilience and seismic resilience um, for, you know, as long as 2013 when he took office as mayor. 
Um, and we have a number of uh, resilient strategies that I will talk about later. I think what keeps me up at night is that um, there's a lot going on, both in terms of our seismic uh, resilience and in terms of our, our you know, sort of multi-hazard uh, resilience. And it's my job to be a matchmaker with all of the partners. And so I think there are a lot of, um, I really appreciate the list of myths, because I think there are a lot of folks in, in the city who feel like um, they want to move. And everything that we're doing is really to make sure that um, everybody knows that they have a role in our resilience and that everybody can uh, take steps to make the city safer and stronger. And it's not going to be the government. It's going to be um, our business community. It's going to be our residents. It's going to be you know, the, the cities that are adjacent to us that all help um, to make the city more resilient and that there's no time like the present <laughs> to keep on doing that work and that resilience, of course, is not an end state. It's a practice and it's something that we have to do all the time, every day. And there's a great opportunity coming up on October 18th, I believe, yes. for something known as the Great Shakeout, the great shakeout. Mm -hmm. event. So we'll, uh, we'll make sure to weave that into the narrative tonight because not only are our organizations um, all involved in helping understand this earthquake risk, doing something about it, trying to get ahead of it so we can um, be resilient once that big earthquake hits and come out of it the other end, um, you know, with a new new uh, day ahead of us. <laughs> um, but we also have an opportunity as individuals too to embrace that responsibility. But we'll get to that. So, so Christine, what gets uh, keeps what you up? What keeps at night? me up at night depends on which scenario earthquake I think about. <laughs> <laughs> and if I think about an earthquake right under downtown from on Puente Hills or Elysian Park, I'm really worried about uh, structures like non-ductile concrete structures that are the big risk of collapse, and that worries me. But more globally, I'd say that for from a, a an uh, point of view of resilience, what worries me the most is a big earthquake on San Andreas, not for the loss of life, but for the loss of water. That could be mm -hmm. three months, six months or more. And we don't think about those things. So, oh, I survived the earthquake. Yeah, but you're, what are you going to drink? You know. So th this, this is really the big concern I have oh. with that. And again, it really depends on the scenario. And if it's Newport Inglewood, then I'm really worried about the health systems. Because, you know, well, there's some really critical facilities that don't have redundancies that are really close to it. And then it points straight towards like UCLA and Cedar sinai that are big trauma centers and trying to deal with emergencies. They will be more messed up. Or if it's the Santa, the Santa Monica fault, it's the same thing. So the worry depends on the scenario. Okay. But globally, <laughs> a long-term resilience for me is really the water, the loss of water. Mm. Uh, for a long time because we can't survive without water. That's fascinating perspective. Stuck yeah. up on water. <laughs> Fill up your garage. Take an extra one home with you tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I'm safe. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you. And how many um, how many faults are there in Southern California? Uh, I, I, can, can you honestly, even count? Honestly, I wouldn't even. So I, I don't I don't even know. I don't remember. But the. Because it depends what you define as a yes. fault. Well, well, <laughs> but we the bottom it. line is, even when we know like where a, specific yeah. faults exist, mm -hmm. when we do hazard, we assume there so could be a 6.5 anywhere, mm -hmm. right? Sure. So Northridge happened on a fault that was not known until the event occurred. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a few hundreds. More than the Bay Area. More than the Bay Area. But uh, so when people <laughs> ask me, Oh, aren't you scared to live in there? No, I'd rather be here, Bay Area. They have both the San Andreas and Hayward and Seattle. They have the subduction zone. No, LA's great. <laughs> and plus, <laughs> plus, they have more preparedness, I think. I'm political here, but I think they're really moving forward with more resilience and they're better prepared. So stay in LA, it's a great place to be. <laughs> <laughs> and you have great weather. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Okay. But you need water. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Okay, Mark, what about you? <clears throat> Christine scares me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, is it better now? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, Christine and her colleagues, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a risk manager. I'm the vice president of risk management uh, and litigation for Watt Companies. Actually, Watt Investment Partners is one of our divisions, and I'm filling in for one of my colleagues who was supposed to be here tonight. But I oversee not just uh, what Watt Investment Partners 
does, but I uh, oversee a, um, a, an organization that builds new houses that has about $800 million in commercial assets, mostly in Southern California. So that's three houses, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. But it, it, so I, I worry about exactly what you were talking about, Christine. I worry about earthquake when it comes to earthquake. We don't worry about a lot of stuff. And you may have noticed that I was being very rude on my phone. I was not being rude on my phone for uh, any other reason other than uh, my job entails this kind of thing. I was, as I was sitting there, I got an urgent text from one of our buildings where we have a massive uh, flood going on right now. Mm -hmm. And I had to dispatch a, a remediation company while I'm getting up here on stage. So, oh, no. we, I, so earthquakes are, are not among the, the, top, um, the top things we worry about. And the problem with, with earthquakes, as I'm sure we're going to hear again, every, we, do, we do a study every two years on our portfolio. Um, we do the full uh, earthquake study through our broker. And um, every, every time we do it, at the end of it, I read the data, I read the, uh, you know, all the terms, the, and, and, they, and we, we try to calculate how we want to buy our, our earthquake coverage. You know, do we want to base it on uh, this model or this model? And every time, when, I actually, when you actually drill down to the final question of <clears throat> what's going to happen, the answer is we don't know. And, uh, and um, so we're relying on scientists like Christine um, to, and, and, and the people that we're hearing from here tonight to, to, to perfect this and to help us with, with um, modeling this stuff because it's, it drives us all crazy. And earthquake insurance, like all catastrophic insurance, is not cheap. It, mm -hmm. We cannot, there is no way we can insure our entire portfolio. And we have to make educated decisions as to how much we can afford to get and what the likelihood is of, of an event. So um, I'm very anxious to hear what we're going to be talking about. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe let's dig a little bit into the different types of structures that are in our built environment. I know, Christine, you'd mentioned the non-ductile um, type. There are other types. Uh, we can maybe go from there and talk about what the city of Los Angeles is doing to address that and possibly what a perspective would come from the private sector in that. Christine? Well, I mean, there's different types of structures, and it's not just buildings, you know. We mm. have to deal with uh, roads, bridges, and so on. I think that the, uh, the earthquake resilience, and Marisa could do it better than me, but it's a holistic approach. It's, if, if you lose all your roads, and the hospitals are functioning, and the doctors cannot get to it, and the patients cannot get there, you're cooked, right? The same with the water, everything's the interdependencies. And what people don't think about often is like, oh, I'm not on a fault, I'm fine. Well, there's the fault rupture itself, which is very localized, and there's a ground motion, there's often liquefaction, there's landslides, there's bridge failures. I, I don't say that to have you panic, it's just you have to think, <laughs> you really have to think it in terms of, this is a, everything is interconnected, right? And everything has to work, and you sometimes, okay, so the, the reason I was concerned about the, the water in LA is like the aqueduct, there's three main aqueducts. I think it's 70% of our water 85. is 85. Sorry. It's coming from imported. <laughs> okay, now you can worry. Uh, but <laughs> one of these aqueducts hugs the San Andreas for miles and miles and miles. You have a rupture there. You cannot just go and fix it. It's not one break. It's tons of breaks. So this is going to impact and trigger you know, other failures and this and that. And other aqueducts, it could be just a tiny little thing that breaks in the system and suddenly nothing works. If you're in a hospital, you think, we think about, oh, the hospital is safe. Yeah, okay, but they didn't put ductile joints for the electricity and the water and so on, so there's no water. Oh, man. It, little, sometimes it could be an easy fix that's mm -hmm. not addressed. So basically, there's a lot of different types of structures that are not buildings. And within buildings, you have a lot of things that behave very differently. You know, I'm lucky I was able to buy a single story wood frame house from 1929, so I had it earthquake retrofitted. These behave pretty well in earthquakes if they're attached to their foundations. If you had a condo that was built, in, you know, with certain types of structural system, it might not be so great. Some tall buildings have other deficiencies. And, and depending on, on all of that, then there's different vulnerability, right? And, and LA has a lot of non ductile concrete structures. Uh, LA was very proactive in dealing with what we call URMs, unreinforced masonry, mm -hmm. that tends to crumble really quickly after a little bit of shaking. 
But all those different types of structures have a different vulnerability, and we have to prioritize. We cannot do everything at once, but where are we going to retrofit? What do we tear down? What do we fix? What we just say, you know what, this one, you know, low occupancy, low risk, and so on. So it's, it's a very complex decision. So. Okay. But there is hope. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so some of the things that the city of Los Angeles and other jurisdictions are doing. Um, so uh, our first uh, sort of set of recommendations around seismic resilience was um, done uh, with a partnership with U.S. Geological Survey and um, the Beyonce of earthquakes, uh, Dr. Jones, um, and a Seismic Safety Task Force. That's my favorite one. They call her a lot of things, but That's I like really that one. Good. Um, and so, um, and and so, Mayor Garcetti released a resilience by design um, that was all based on, on the shakeout scenario um, in December of 2014. And um, so, that's almost almost uh, four years ago. And so, we have a progress report. Um, in the recommendations, um, two of the big recommendations were around mandating the retrofits of our software story buildings and our non-ductile concrete buildings. So software story buildings are the dingbats, uh, tuck under parking, the ones that you see with the poles. Um, and so uh, we have 13,500 of them or so in the city of Los Angeles. They house approximately a half million Angelinos. 99% um, of them fall under our rent stabilization ordinance, so they're effectively um, naturally occurring affordable housing. Um, and so these are really important buildings in a time where we have a significant affordable housing crisis, we have a significant homeless crisis, and we have a half a million Angelinos living in buildings that we know will probably fall down um, in a major earthquake. So the seismic retrofit mandates were signed um, by the mayor in October of 2015. And as of today, we have approximately 50% of those 13,500 buildings uh, have retrofits underway. We've noticed every single building owner and are working with them to get those retrofits done. And we have over 1,000 of those buildings that are complete and retrofitted. So that is good news. Yay. Um, and then second, uh, the non-ductile concrete buildings, and there are, we're still working it out, but there are around 1,500 of those. Um, and they've all, or almost all, been noticed. And so that retrofit pro uh, program, as some of you know, is a little more complicated than the uh, soft story retrofits. But um, the timeline, which the city council and Mayor Garcetti set, is 25 years, and the clock is starting. And so um, they'll have about two and a half to three years to um, turn in checklists to our, our building and safety department, about 10 years to figure out plans and what they're going to do and how they're going to retrofit, and then 25 years to complete the retrofit. So all of these retrofits should be done by about 2043. Um, but we're moving forward. And then in um, the Mayor's Resilient Los Angeles, um, I have a prop. Uh, we uh, talk about reorganizing re, um, the Mayor's Seismic Safety Task Force and looking at the sort of next set of vulnerable buildings um, and seeing what we can do about them. Um, but in addition to buildings, really quickly, and cut me off at any time, um, some of the other infrastructure that, you know, so we're trying to prioritize. We're trying to look at our most vulnerable buildings and our most vulnerable telecommunications. So another um, ordinance that we passed in, I think, 2015, 2016, was around requiring that our cell towers be built at a, uh, like a public safety standard um, at the standard that you would build a, a fire station. Um, and so we have a number of new cell towers that are being built at this public safety standard and not at a lower building code. Um, and I think that's really important for the fact that, you know, Northridge uh, was a long time ago when we really didn't rely on things like the internet like we do today. Um, and so things that we can do with these important critical infrastructure to make them stronger. And the last thing that I'll just mention in terms of you're scaring me, um, and I don't Sorry. get scared anymore, um, is that we've been prioritizing our water infrastructure for the reasons that you heard about. Um, and uh, so one of the recommendations in Resilience by Design is, is really around these 
these three or four, how, depending on how technical you are in counting, um, aqueducts that cross the San Andreas. And um, the city of Los Angeles owns one-ish, depending on how you count. <laughs> and then um, the, the, Metro uh, the Department of Water Resources and um, the Metropolitan Water District own the others. And prior to 2015 or so, uh, those individuals were not so much coordinating. Um, but uh, we wrote a strategy, they read it, they called, and now um, we're working with them and have a five-year plan and we're exercising annually and we're recognizing that those individual systems need to be assessed, we need to share resources, we need to train, and after a major San Andreas event, we're gonna be able to work together to see which of these aqueducts can we bring back first, mm -hmm. um, and what are the resources collectively we have, and how can we work together to bring the first aqueduct back, and then the second one, and then the third one, and the fourth one, mm -hmm. um, and not work in silos, which I think is really exciting and um, important. And then finally, we're, uh, That's your second finally, by nope. the way. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> gonna keep going, because we're doing so much, and because you were really, really scary. So, <laughs> so we also are recognizing the, the fire falling earthquake risk that's mm. in the city, and um, the fact that our uh, water pipes um, break on a regular day, let alone an earthquake day, and the aging in infrastructure is a huge component in sort of our seismic risk. It really exacerbates our risk. And so um, uh, sort of as a, a pilot solution to that, we started um, piloting a seismic resilient pipe that we imported from Japan in 2015. And we had five different pilots, and one of them was around the Northridge um, Hospital. And now we're continuing to invest in seismic resilient pipe. We've changed the marketplace um, domestically when it comes to seismic resilient pipe. Folks recognize that a seismic resilient pipe doesn't leak in an earthquake, but it doesn't leak on a regular day either. So that's really exciting. And so we're working with DWP to create a seismic resilient pipe network in the city so that we'll have more reliable water, so that the fire department will have more reliable water in order to fight many, many, many fires that will probably um, break out after a major earthquake um, and trying to get water to critical infrastructure first so that we can keep that open so that we can all bounce back. And then I'm done. <laughs> Wonderful. So many great things going on in the, the city. What, how about uh, with your organization? Well, what I, what I was going to ask is, you know, this is, this is, this is very important stuff. And, um, you know, from a risk management point of view, I mean, it, obviously, we, we, have all, we have many properties in the city of Los Angeles. We have properties, though, everywhere else in California as well. It seems to me that there ought to be um, a statewide um, coalition to work this out on a, state, on a statewide basis. Are you involved working with Sacramento at all in, on this stuff? Or a little bit. A little, little bit. bit. Because this is, <laughs> here's the, this is getting me interested. I'm, I'm also the vice, vice chair of the uh, external affairs committee for the risk and insurance management society and we lobby congress we were just up on capitol hill a couple of weeks ago and um in, in washington and but we also have a uh, an event on, on in sacramento every uh, uh, rims on the mall we call it every march and i think this may be something that we should be looking at to to lobby the, the, the assembly and uh, the at least, state uh, senate. At least lobby to support the bills that are currently uh, yeah. being proposed. Well, that's, I think this is incredibly important yeah. stuff. Um, well, we so. are here today with the uh, Price School, my, my esteemed alum organization. Um, big round of applause. <laughs> so, and, and I know a lot, of, a lot of our training was in public administration, public policy. We've got a couple big ideas up, uh, that are now uh, made its way through the legislature and are mm -hmm. uh, at the governor's desk. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, there's trade-offs. That's one thing we learn in policy analysis. It's not. Uh, it's never cut and dry. And there are yeah. some of those. Well, maybe we could talk about some of those trade-offs. Well, though, one of the trade-offs, obviously, from the private sector is money. Costs money. The retrofitting. That, I mean, we're in the city of Santa Monica, and they have a very tough retrofitting. Mm -hmm. uh, our, our our headquarters building is undergoing that. And so we, you know, we have to balance. We have, we think that generally the the rules that have been imposed at City of LA are very fair as far as timing and that sort of thing. Uh, but it it does create a, a prop. There is there is a problem with the cost of having to do retrofitting, and um, 
this again on a statewide basis, um, there are a lot of communities in this state that where they're you know it's very difficult um, economically <clears throat> for for that to happen. So I think that's something that needs to be looked at as well because you know from an owner of you're, if you're talking about um, you know we we own mostly large commercial uh, assets, but we also are owner of apartment buildings and. Mm -hmm. Um, I can just see that you know the the work that needs to be done in some of the areas where you've got small property owners mm -hmm. of fairly large apartment buildings mm -hmm. in places where the where the fault is right there. I mean, I could see that that would be an issue. So you know, uh, and again, of course, look at the cost of insurance is very high. So a lot of apartment owners don't purchase um, earthquake insurance. Mm -hmm. So and that's a big concern. So when I was mm -hmm. shopping to buy a property. Personally, I wanted, I didn't care about the house. I wanted the land, I swear. I mean, because I don't have the budget to worry about having a fancy house oh, in a fancy <laughs> neighborhood. But, you know, I cared about the land because then I was telling someone else, I can pitch a tent in it, right? If there's an earthquake, I, have, I own the land. And for me, I was adamant that if I was ever going to buy a condo in a condo building, I would never buy if the homeowner association didn't have earthquake insurance. Right. If it's my house, I'm fine without earthquake insurance. I do my retrofit, I look at it, and I'm happy I have the land. But, if, you know, those issues for apartments, for renters, there's no protection. Mm -hmm. You lose everything and you displace a lot of people. Mm -hmm. We're compact, and where do they go? We, you know? we, did, we did a, you know, I did, our company went, uh, did, had made a, a business decision to acquire more apartment buildings, to get more into multifamily. Um, a few years ago, and so I was tasked with looking at how the market is, mm -hmm. and it was very tough competitively for us to compete with with um, with buyer uh, other buyers of apartment buildings simply because we learned that we insure our our buildings with earthquake insurance, but they don't. and they, most most uh, owners uh, of, of apartment buildings, uh, in, at least on the West Coast, where you should have it. Uh, don't buy earthquake insurance, and so that made it made them more competitive in what they could do as far as a sales price, and um, it really um, it affects how we do business now, where we make a strategic decision on some of our apartment buildings, wherever they are, to not get earthquake insurance. Talk about something that keeps you up at night, you know. That's that is so. That's this is all stuff that needs to be. We need to figure that stuff out to get more protection for it. So on earthquake insurance. So we don't have great numbers on earthquake <clears throat> insurance. Um, the California Earthquake Authority has some numbers, and so we know that statewide it's about uh, anywhere from 10 to 12 percent of um, mostly single-family homeowners have earthquake insurance. In Los Angeles, I've heard numbers as high as 16 or 17 percent. And that went up from before. Yeah, they no. went up a lot. Yeah, right. No, yeah. we're it's like, still low. Keeps yeah. on going up. Um, yeah. And one of my uh, favorite meetings in the last th almost three and a half years as uh, chief resilience officer was with a f the former mayor of of Christchurch, um, New Zealand. And he came to LA, and um, there was a room of fifty of us, and he had his entire talk based on how challenging his job was because 5% of the buildings in Christchurch were not insured. <laughs> and we all looked around at each other and like, who's gonna tell him? Yeah, really? That like, he should have maybe done a little more homework. <laughs> because what, like, what keeps us up at night is not that 5%, mm -hmm. it's the 90%. Mm -hmm. um, and we're risking 90% of our properties on a daily basis in the state of California because that's the situation we have. And you see uh, disaster after disaster, whether it's flood insurance or earthquake insurance, if, if you don't have insurance and, and you know, these events disproportionately affect vulnerable populations. Mm -hmm. And there was a um, study from Rice that one of my awesome students brought to my attention there in the room, that's why I said that. <laughs> um, about how communities of color actually lose money after a disaster and, and communities that are white gain money after a disaster. And so there's a lot to be talked about in terms of uh, how insurance and how sort of the financial education, yeah. and education and, and all priorities. these components really uh -huh. disproportionately affect vulnerable communities and yes. they're the ones who 
um, we need to be prioritizing and, and thinking about how to, um, how to make change uh, I impact them as well as everybody else. And it's kind of a vicious circle because if you're vulnerable because of, uh, you know, not enough financial means and so on, your priority is not to plan against the potential earthquake, you know. You care about daily eating, you know, and, and surviving and dealing with difficulties. So you, you're less prepared. So it's, it's kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy right there. And, and the thing I'd like to add to this whole discussion is that we, we, talk, we talk about, the, I mean, it's amazing what you and your team at, at LA, the city of LA are doing, but resilience is never ending. You start with the worst risk, the most impact, maybe the hospitals, that there's been a, the Oshpod, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. you schools? Know, yeah, the schools. Field Act. Uh, all the things are due to deal with emergencies and so on. But then after that, you go, no, okay, non-ductal structures, okay, we do that. Next, you know, so it's a never-ending process of, of rebuilding this, the building stock and so on. And you look at every, all the building stock in, the, in the, the United States, and you can correct me on my statistics, but I think that every decade there's about 2% that is renewed only because you have all the old aging stuff that's still there and you build new but you rarely replace. Mm -hmm. So you end up with an aging build it stock that was built with old building codes that had a lot of deficiencies because they haven't learned from the earthquakes back then and so on. So I think that today you focus on those. Next time, okay, what's the next biggest one? And it's a never ending thing. And people should learn to accept that, not see that as, oh, the, it's despair. No, it's something you need to commit to for a very long time and forever. It's you go to the next highest risk and you, that's how you improve society. Mm -hmm. Well, yes. And again, the issue is how do you do it? How do you pay for it? And, yeah. you know, we were, when we were up on Capitol Hill a couple of weeks ago, what we were really lobbying about is, is flood insurance because that's a huge, a huge issue for people not on, in this part of the country. And it, uh, as, uh, as, uh, as, um, yeah, here too. It's, it's, yeah, but because, because of the, uh, the, the huge catastrophic risk of flood and wind and hurricanes that we don't get here. Um, it, the a lot of a lot of the people in my business are very East Coast centric, sure. and one of the things I hope to do when I elevate to the chair of this committee that I'm on is to focus more on on this type of issue on, on catastrophic earthquake loss because what they what they've done what they've done with NFIP with the National Flood Insurance Program mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of problems with it, but there are they are finally trying to work out ways now, and we were advocating for this to bring the private sector in mm -hmm. and involve it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and and expand the program and find creative ways to do that and we really need to do that with earthquake as well mm -hmm. find a way for, because of the, what you just described massive communities that don't have insurance where you where you'll have in the, in the next big quake you're going to have this you're going to have one neighbor that's got earthquake insurance and the neighbor next door is not going to have it and unfortunately what will happen is is FEMA will come in and or somebody will come in and probably Pay to have everybody's house fixed, but it will it. But it, it will be the the division of the of the, of how the money is spent is not is not equitable. Mm -hmm. And what you need to do is figure out a way to bring private and public sector um, financing in so that it works for everybody. And I really hope we can figure out a way to do that because otherwise, it's it's only going to get worse. And by the way, when you mentioned how you know in the California Earthquake Authority. Right now, the numbers are going up. There's a great ad campaign. Oh, yeah. you know, I'm a Dodger fan. They, they have four or five advertisements for that on, on yeah. every Dodger game. But, the, but uh, speaking of somebody who's in, who deals with this every year, right now, the earthquake insurance market is very soft. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's very inexpensive right now. But as soon <laughs> as an event happens, um, and it, actually even with the events happening with, in the catastrophic losses with flooding now, it's, it's reached about as low as it's going to get, and it's going to get more expensive again. So we really need to work on that. There's a lot to work on. <laughs> a lot That's to keep everybody clear. up at night, right? I, I think part of the challenge with uh, earthquakes is that it's, uh, I, I, when people ask me what I do sometimes, well, I work in the realm of low probability, high consequences, and that's true. Mm. And you, you know that, you know, you've heard the numbers, it's more dangerous to drive on the freeway than to die in an earthquake. Yes, okay, but when an earthquake happens, it's completely catastrophic, but it's rare. So we really deal with that, and we need to kind of prepare because the consequences can be really be devastating. And 
and it's tricky and it's it's hard to find funding for something that looks ah oh, I'll never see that in my lifetime, oh. you know. And it, I, I remember to have in-laws visit LA and we go in the restaurant, oh, beautiful brick walls. Like, yeah, URM, I'm out of here. <laughs> <laughs> and it, and it, right? It's, it's kind of funny, the different perception. Uh, yeah, you know? right. yeah. And then it's like, yeah, but it's rare. Yes, but that's what I do for a living. So, I'm, you know, I'm going to be close to the door so I can just run out. That's the one case where you don't drop cover and hold on because you know you just run out as well. <laughs> In general, you drop cover and hold on. Well, but, we can have know? a fierce debate about that later. <laughs> <laughs> but, Anyways. Yeah. Um, so, so let's talk about a little bit about preparedness. Um, we we have a an opportunity, I think, as not only as you know students going through uh, price school programs and uh, universities and in our professional areas to to take a step back and think what can I do to prepare myself for this day because we know it's not if but when. We know we live in earthquake country. Um, so we can prepare ourselves, we can prepare our workplaces, and we can prepare our families and communities. Um, what are some ways we can do that? Well, I'll go first because you probably have much more um, big picture ideas. From a practical standpoint, um, for how many people here are in the insurance business? Is there anybody? Okay, we got oh, some. Okay. So, so you, okay, yeah. So you know, I mean, right now, it, we're living in a great time. I mean, there, is, there are ways to do, um, to prepare that are getting less and less expensive. Notification systems. The biggest, the biggest issue we care about, uh, other, other than no, number one, is preserving data. Because a da your data is the thing you've got to protect the most mm. after an earthquake. Otherwise, your company just can't function. So you have to do that first, but there's ways to do that now that are getting less and less expensive. But our other main focus is people. Your people need to know what to do after, after an earthquake happens. And there are systems available now that we are just getting ready to implement in our company, uh, not expensive at all, that uh, will automatically notify, um, notify all of our employees what's happening, you know, wh where to go, what to do, what not to do. And, and, there's a, and it's, you structure it through a select group of people who have the responsibility of doing certain things when, the, when, the, when the event happens, and it's and it's instantaneous, and it and it gives your people one less thing to worry about because they know what's going on with their job and and with, and and you know, so they they they're not worried about that in addition to all the other things that they're dealing with after an earthquake. That's just one example of the of the. Um, and there's a, there's a term of art, it's insurance people, what's the term of art for recovery? I can't think of the name of it right now because I'm, I guess I'm a little stage, got a little stage fright. But there's a term for it where you, where you can prepare. It's a, it's, a, it's a holistic program of setting up within your organization um, preparedness for not just for an earthquake, a but for any business plan? continuity. Okay. Business, yeah, continuity. business continuity. continuity, my goodness. What but a business <laughs> continuity program that, will, that you, will prepare you for any event. You know, God forbid, a terrorist event, an earthquake, anything. And when I first started doing this, I've been in the business now for 35 years. It was, there was nobody, it was all ridiculous. It was expensive and there was no way to do it. With the technology we have today, it, it's something that I recommend if, you, if you're in a private business, to look into that because a business continuity a consultants and programs and technology hmm. is, um, is, is available and not and easy to get. So that's what I would. That's the thing that I would say, if you're if you're in the private sector or, or if you're on a school or if you're on a, a hospital or anything like that. Well, one thing I know that Kell OES partners with SCEC um, through the Earthquake Country Alliance, and we have a wealth of resources for you for your um, businesses in that business continuity. Mm -hmm. There's a there's a campaign going on right now known as Outsmart Disaster, which is targeting the business community to help mm -hmm. challenge a business resilience challenge mm -hmm. to get. Um, not only so that you can take those steps, but also show the world mm -hmm. that your business is uh, resilient and has gone mm -hmm. through that. Mm -hmm. um, so and then earthquakecountryalliance.org. There it Plug. is. Write that down. No? What is it? <laughs> earthquakecountry.org. Ah. I just we cut added a word out something. To make it easier. <laughs> we'll send you an email. <laughs> but not only is there technology for after the event, but there's emerging technology that is uh, starting to roll out this fall about how we can 
send you an alert uh, once the earthquake started, but before the shaking mm -hmm. has hit in many cases. Yeah, I'd love, that's what will, I, was, uh, I was ill. I want to hear about that. Yeah. So, anyway. Tell me what's going on with that. Marissa. Should I talk about that, or should I talk about preparedness, <laughs> or should I talk about both? Um, hmm. So I'll do another plug, which is, um, you know, I think, I think part of preparedness is around recognizing risk um, and not being afraid of it and not, par not using that as a way to just be paralyzed and not do anything. Um, and so uh, Christine had mentioned uh, water before, like no joke, like get water. Um, one, one gallon per person per day if you like your pets, some for them. Um, for seven, seven to 14 days. Um, we have recently changed the sort of wording that we say when we talk about preparedness. It used to be three days. Um, the resilient strategy really talks about seven to 14 days. That's what you see happening in places like the Carolinas or Hawaii or so on. Um, but then I think that there's an opportunity to practice. This is where the plug comes in. So I hope that you will all join me on 1018 at 1018 um, in the morning for the great shakeout. Um, we're really excited that LA City uh, is going to be one of the places where the great shakeout is celebrated this year. Um, and I think that's a good opportunity. And it doesn't have to be just once a year. It could be once a month um, where you get really um, ready to drop cover and hold on or you know use that that day and that opportunity as a way to think about making a kit a to go bag um, i have a hard hat next to my door um, <laughs> and recognizing that we do live in earthquake country and that if you're prepared and if you have resources and i have like six gallons of water in my car that's that's interesting like, you that's heard what that you do six gallons in our car okay I mean, that's I, what Costco's for. Yeah. Never so, met anyone like that. That's so I think you can just do that um, and take an opportunity to feel less scared, put together a plan, like figure it all out. There are so many resources. We live in Southern California. There are so many resources, and you just need to take a day and do it. So if you don't do it before October 18th, do it all on October 18th. Right, and there are, there are uh, we, we, every, every other, every third year or so, we, on, on the, the day of the great shakeout, we have people come in to, to talk about that, and, and, and employees can go and um, uh, listen to presentations uh, on what to do, and would not just do the drill, but but listen to you know how they can be prepared in their own homes, in their cars. Um, so yeah, it's very important. So I'd like to plug here Mark Bentian and uh, Sharon Sandow, who are the king and queen of. Uh, <laughs> And Jason, and Jason is right and there, the of course, yeah, yeah. That, that are at Skek, who are really the leaders of ShakeOut and making it happen and so on. Our plugs were okay, yeah? Plugs are okay, yes. I'm just, you know, checking. No, no, if you have questions. Worldwide and headquartered at USC. Yes, exactly. That's right. Okay, well, you know, we only have a couple minutes left, but I know the, um, how many of you in the audience have heard of either ShakeAlert or Earthquake Early Warning? Some? Okay, a good, good group, excellent. The word is getting out. I know Bob's heard of it. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Cal OES, uh, the US Geologic Survey, USC, the city of Los Angeles, there's a lot of organizations that are, um, again, we're right at the precipice of being able to have this ability to send us an alert prior to the shaking occurring at your location. Now, there's, there's some caveats to that, and that would require a whole nother lecture by, by John to come up and tell us all the differences in that, and we're hoping to make that uh, available to the, uh, to the state and to residents here, and to you all, of course, um, so you can get caught up to speed to your level, um, increase your level of understanding. But well, what does that look like? Uh, what may it look like coming up in the coming months? Well, we have a prototype that's been running at SCEC for a long time. Yeah. Uh, and it's interesting because it beeps, 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 and earthquake, earthquake. And I don't know how the final message is going to be, but I, ours, the one we have is very simple. So low shape, shaking, no shaking, or mild shaking expected, and then they give you a number of seconds. And then it's just enough to say, oh, hold on, it's going to shake. 
<laughs> that's because we're scientists, so we're all excited uh, and figuring uh, out. So whereas you should be rehearsing <laughs> drop cover and hold on. Yeah, go of course, drop yeah. cover yeah. and hold on. Thank and you. Like, yeah. on. Oh man, that's a 5.5, oh, 60 kilometers. No, no, six point, you know, anyway, so that's what we do. But <laughs> the thing. <laughs> you know, you're, you're all sitting there taking bets on how strong it's going to be. <laughs> I was once at UCLA during the Chino Hills earthquake 2008. It was funny. I, I was actually working on a non ductile concrete list back yeah. then. Yeah. I was there and started shaking. And and I was like, oh, do I drop cover and hold on? And I was debating, and then it stopped. And then I heard people running everywhere. And then I go in the department, we're all, yeah, five, about 60. We're just all talking, <laughs> just excited. But the thing, so I don't want to bash it at all. Earthquake early warning is great. It's great, but it's not always an early warning. It can happen sometimes after the shaking because of the time for signal and so on. But if it gives you just even a few seconds to just drop cover and hold on is enough, five seconds. If you have maybe 28 seconds and you know you're in a brick building, maybe you run out, although default is drop cover and hold on. It's usually the safest response if you don't know. I'm more discriminant with that because you know I know where I'm at and so on and I do this for a living. But it's really just a few seconds can be enough for you to pull over your car away from something dangerous, move away from a building that's like here downtown full of glass, you just want to run away from there. You know, it's, it can be enough to really get you in a safer situation, so. So now part of the challenge with this, we've invested a lot of funds, USGS has been working on this for a long time with some of its partner universities. Um, Cal OES has invested $25 million in the system. City of Los Angeles. Uh, and the city of Los Angeles. Just under six million in the sensor network as well. And, and now it's the time to get it to the folks. So really quickly, um, just want to hear what the city of Los Angeles is looking to do to get it out to the, um, to the residents here in LA, and then we'll start a question and answer. Sure, so um, Mayor Garcetti, uh, in his State of the City address in 2017, um, said that uh, we would have earthquake early warning out to Angelinos by the tw uh, end of 2018. Um, so I think that stressed out half of the people in this room. <laughs> um, and so we're really excited that we're, we're able to work with um, USGS and a number of partners uh, on two pilots uh, that will be part of that very limited public rollout, um, hopefully by the end of the year, um, around a, a pilot in City Hall and then an a, a earthquake early warning app. Um, and so we've been um, working on, on those things. Um, for me, I think um, once, once those are off, um, we've been having all of these conversations over the last few years about how to integrate earthquake early warning into the Internet of Things and um, mm -hmm. how to you know, look at the city um, structures uh, as an opportunity to really test out some of um, these technologies around shutting things off or turning things on or moving cranes or um, elevators or whatever yeah. it might be. Um, and so I think once once we get a little bit further, mm -hmm. the, the applications are just going to multiply, and that's really exciting as well. Mm -hmm. OK, great. Well, now is a good chance to take some questions from the audience. Uh, this is a question for Marissa. There are a lot of different types of constructions that are allowed in LA. And I was wondering, um, I won't sue you for this if you have the wrong answer or anything like that. <laughs> but uh, um, what, would you, what would be your recommendation for, say, a single family home and a high-rise building. You know, those can be built out of concrete, out of steel, uh, out of wood. Uh, what would be the, the best option, in your opinion? I'm going to defer to my, <laughs> my scientist over here. Um, I mean, so, so one of the conversations that we didn't have that I think is applicable to your question is this um, reality of the building code and the building code really be focused on life safety and on you being able to crawl out of a building and survive. And there are a lot of conversations happening right now about immediate occupancy or functional recovery or how to make sure that when we build buildings, we build them to be able to be usable after a major earthquake. Um, I think with your single family home option, uh, minding liquefaction and other issues. I mean, 
you're, you're going to be pretty okay. I think with the high rises, that's where, um, you know, the more that we can get to being able to use buildings, um, having them be, uh, like I talked about before, that sort of headed towards the public safety requirements um, of, uh, I mean, a 1.25 or a 1.5 um, importance value. I mean, that's my hope is that we'll continue to make advancements um, in how we build our buildings like we make advancements in everything else that we're doing, like technology or automotive you know, uses or so on. Okay. And maybe I just add, so even when you say tall buildings or, you know, the tallish, you know, the concrete structures, I'm not a structural engineer, I'm a geotech, but I've worked a lot with structural response and so on. And even within that, there's so many different designs inherent, right? Mm -hmm. Some are steel moment resisting frame that are encased in concrete. Some are pure steel frame. Some are all kinds of different ways to do these things. And each of them have different vulnerabilities that are known, for example, that are more prone to fail in that way and so on. And when you look at these things, so it's easier to build a new building correctly. And there's a, there are ways to build in fuses in buildings, and people don't realize that. But you can design a building so that certain beams will fail and allow the damage to be concentrated in a way that's repairable versus to... So something came out, for example, following Northridge. A new provision in the building code was called literally strong column weak beams. Because they discovered that people, you know, would just do the same thing for the beams as the columns, but you lose a column, you lose the whole building. You lose a beam, you lose part of the building. Anyways, things like that are learned, and you can build in fuse, you can put in dampers, you can put in base isolators. There's a lot of things you can do. Um, in retrofit, it's much harder and much more costly. Even sometimes just evaluating a building to see if it's safe or not as part of those non-ductile mm -hmm. concrete structure, it could, it could cost 100000 just to look to figure out if it's safe or not. So it's not really easy. But there's different strategies for different types of structural systems. So and I why. just wanted to, were you talking about existing buildings or new buildings? Mm -hmm. New buildings. Uh, new buildings, there's a lot of different strategies that can mm -hmm. be put in there. Base isolation can work uh, very well by basically the ground shakes under, more or less, right? Mm -hmm. and, yeah. Is the, is the building code designed after a specific magnitude? Okay. So that's, a, that's one of my pet peeve <laughs> misconception <laughs> and me, myth. Just People say, oh, my building was designed for magnitude seven. Yeah, this means nothing. So, <laughs> what we, what people You've design for first. is ground yeah. motion, which oh. is usually a combination mm -hmm. of magnitude, distance, sight, this, that, all kinds of stuff, and the natural period of your building as well, and so on, and all those things. So we design for ground motions, not for a magnitude. Although usually there is an event that's associated with it. If you're next to San Andreas, you're probably designed for a seven point something at you know, 10 kilometers and so on. And that's how ground motions are defined to design the building. And if you're very close to a fault, you expect more displacement. So it's gonna be a different type of design than just the shaking. Hmm. So th there's all kinds of things. And if you design, it's funny because I do conferences sometimes, we use a lot of supercomputers at SCEC. And those people asked me to come to talk about what we do. I said, you guys, you don't even realize. You can design your building. It's going to be super stiff and all that. And you're going to lose all your content. Because the, the building resilience itself and the content, they, they behave on completely different. Right? And one is low frequency. The, the other one is high frequency sensitive. So all those different things have to be put in depending on the usage. And I've talked too much, but that's it. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, different things for different strategies. Yeah. Okay, I think I saw a couple more hands coming up the aisle here, and we have a few more. Oh, um, well, first of all, thank you all for coming tonight. Um, my question is pretty simple. I was just wondering, is each city responsible for ensuring that its buildings uh, meet you know, the correct standards? Because I know there's a lot of information within Los Angeles in terms of how many buildings um, you know, are safe, but I know there's other cities that don't seem to have as much information. So I was wondering if you could talk about that. Yeah, our experience is, is, that, is, is that it's not, there's not enough global, statewide, or even federal control on that, that there probably should be more. 
So they're building codes, yeah. which I think are established the through the, those are a minimum. minimum. Yeah, those are not, yeah, And each those are city. often enforced by local jurisdictions, mm -hmm. which is part of the challenge of taking some of the great work that the city of LA has done and thinking right. about how we scale it to, the, to a statewide program. And that gets into the yeah. question of resources and local control and such. Um, right. so, so certain cities can have more stringent requirements, right. like Santa Monica, but right. never okay. below the code. They're below, okay. There is a basic universal building code in California. But it, it, frankly, just this is my opinion, it's not, it, for earthquake safety, it's not, it, it's not enough. It doesn't do enough. And we need, we need to figure out a way to make it stronger. It's called the uniform building code. Okay. All right, maybe one more up here and then we'll go to these other sections. So yeah, this uh, question is for the gentleman in risk management. I'm asking this question as a landlord. Uh, I primarily focus on single tenant industrial. I was going to ask which specific commercial asset type out here do you find to be the most earthquake resistant? And then second question is, as a prospective buyer and a landlord looking in this area, what are kind of your deal breakers? Aside deal from breakers the for earthquake. That's a tough one. But, but to answer your first question, if you're dealing mostly in industrial, you say? Uh, single tenant industrial. Single tenant industrial. That's, that's a pretty... And it's, those are usually tilt up concrete yes. buildings, right? It's, it's right. And so, you know, they've got, they've got their issues, obviously, because of that type of construction. Um, but if you don't, my opinion and what we've seen, what we've seen is we actually have a, a complex in Northridge. Um, and it did very well uh, in, in, the, in, the, um, in the Northridge earthquake, whereas um, more uh, like a, a high rise. Uh, was it was much more difficult to, to, to find that we you know find the issues to, that we could repair, but as far as what and so I think you know what you what you do what we do when we go and we look at any building but that for that particular type of construction you need to get a structural engineer you need to get somebody to go and look at it before you buy it it's like anything else what I was going to say well, the reason I was asking the gentleman you know were you talking about new or existing construction. If you own a commercial building, and, uh, or even a, even a residential, but if, particularly if you own a, a resident, a uh, commercial building, you people just don't understand this. Your insurance carriers, your property carriers, want to help you. And nowadays, most of them. This is not. This was not true even ten years ago. But nowadays, most of your insurance carriers have an entire division of really smart structural engineers and scientists like Christine, that work for them, that will come out and either for, for really for no cost to you to look at your buildings and, and to look at buildings that you're thinking of buying too. So these are resources that you should talk to your insurance broker about mm. because it, there are ways to do that to find out if you're buying a safe building or if your building needs work that shouldn't cost you an arm and a leg. Now, the fix might, but finding out what's there it shouldn't be that hard to do. And I'd like to say, if you have a lot of tilt-ups, I'm, again, I'm not a structural, but from what I've seen or heard, it's probably the easiest thing to retrofit. And that's mm -hmm. something that if I was an owner, I would do it right away. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, a non ductile concrete structure, well, that might be complicated. But, you know, yeah. there are things, yeah, you should investigate. It's important. Right. It's, your, right. it's, your, it's your assets. Right in the back there. I think, yeah. Thanks. So my question is for Marissa is, yeah. do you have any strategy on community education forums for the homeowners and renters as far as how the resources work for them? Because most people don't understand how the California Earthquake Authority policies work. Okay. Renters don't realize that they too can get a policy even if the apartment is covered, the renter isn't. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. is there any strategy around that? Yeah, I mean, so few things broadly. So right after we launched the mandatory seismic retrofits, um, I come pre pre mayor's office. Um, I come from one very proud urban planner, but two, um, I spent six years uh, as a land use consultant working with developers and landowners and business mm. owners um, to do entitlements. And so I felt very strongly that as we were rolling out new requirements, we also held a, a resource fair. And so um, in about six weeks, I used my conference planning skills to um, get 
86 vendors at the convention center where we held a retrofit resource fair for about 2,000 of the, we noticed it to 13,500 building owners, 2,000 of them showed up. Um, and we started, we started to figure out how best to provide information. Um, we held another uh, resource fair the next year and a little over 1,000 of these building owners showed up. Um, and we were able to connect them with contractors and engineers and, and banks and so on, um, uh, including all of the city departments that have anything to do with the retrofit programs. Um, and so that was sort of our first opportunity to really try and get as many resources out there as, as possible. Now, um, something that we didn't quite go into, but there are 96 actions in this new strategy. Um, and a lot of them are working with partners. And the first chapter is really about resilient Angelinos because the intent is that if uh, any Angelino opens this book, the first part of it is really what they can do mm -hmm. and what they can do with existing resources or existing incentives. And so there are things in there about earthquake insurance or about the Brazen Bolt program um, that the state has. Um, and so we're also, um, uh, Mayor Garcetti, uh, when we launched uh, Resilient Los Angeles, signed an executive uh, directive on resilience. And so that requires all of our general managers and commissioners to integrate resilience into their strategic plans, their budgets, their general manager reviews, and to appoint. Now we have about 30 departmental chief resilience officers that I work with in 30 of our departments to try and spread this information to everyone. And then we also asked our 98 or so neighborhood councils to appoint neighborhood council resilience liaisons. And so we held our first convening of all of them a few months ago. Um, and we're asking each of the neighborhood councils to put together preparedness and resilience plans so that we can really um, work with communities to get this information out uh, using all of the networks that we have. That's a huge cool. lift. We're an office of two, <laughs> just gonna say that. Most of our pipes are gonna bust in many of our wells. So then the challenge is to drill new wells if we need them. The problem for policy managers and planners is to think in advance, who do we need to have arrangements with, MOUs or other agreements so that they're available. I know on the generator side, after Sandy that New York couldn't find or locate generators because yeah. they didn't know where they were. Mm. And the problem is here, most of the generators are already signed up in advance by the movie companies and others so that <laughs> yes. if LA City tries to get hold of generators, you probably won't be able to. We have some. You have some, <laughs> but probably not enough. The issue then is on the water side, if you need to drill new wells, I'd like to know if you've identified at Cal OES, how many water drillers companies are there? How many do you have in advance arrangements with? Don't have the answer to that question, but I do know that that was part of our drought response, um, was trying to locate those uh, companies because especially in the Central Valley for communities that were not on one of the other state or federal water projects. Um, and again, that. But it's a good question that I can bring back to Sacramento. Local water is, so. is very limited, right? 15%, I was generous with my 30, but But, it's, uh, but we do have a commitment, um, Mayor Garcetti has a commitment to um, increase our local water supply uh, up to, I think, 50% by 2035. And a lot yeah. of what we're doing around stormwater capture and a number of other efforts is really, and, and um, uh, the sort of reclamation of the um, Great. Uh, groundwater mm -hmm. in the San Fernando Valley. Um, we're trying to um, work um, on this issue in a multitude of ways um, because of the risk. Okay. Uh, yeah, um, so I work in healthcare. I work with a lot of hospitals that are faced right now with seismic retrofit issues. Mm. Yes. Uh, billions of dollars and hospitals are now either faced with either meeting those requirements or shutting down. Yeah. which represents also a threat to public safety today as opposed to a disaster somewhere down the road. Yeah, that's true. Uh, many of them are asking for legislative assistance in terms of extending, so on and so forth. We have a 2020 yeah. requirement and now a, 30, a 2030 requirement. Um, is there going to be some kind of balance that we're going to be looking at in terms of being able to address this? or is this So I'm not involved at all in, that, in this. I just 
collaborate with people who are OSHPA, the entity that uh, brought this, uh, this regulation. So I don't know how they'll deal with that, but I agree. If you're going to shut down hospitals now, you really jeopardize the, the possibility of responding in case it doesn't get damaged. So it's, it's a very tricky issue. I'm not sure how it's going to get uh, solved, and I have no answer on that, unfortunately. I, I do know that one of the opportunities that some hospitals are looking at um, is how to use the, the state's uh, hazard mitigation funds mm. in order to help be able to retrofit. Um, and so that's at least one pathway. Okay. Um, City. Hmm? City or the county, I'm sorry. State. State. Ryan, <laughs> you, talk to Ryan. <laughs> not, not my day job, but I do have colleagues and it's, uh, yeah, FEMA. FEMA's actually, uh, and the state of California, I think, is moving this way, and some of the larger cities are really prioritizing um, how do we reduce our risk, and that's one of those things, using hazard mitigation funding to be very aggressive on that. So I hate to do this, but I have to wrap up. <laughs> um, so uh, firstly, uh, thanks to the audience for your great questions and taking the time to come out and be with us tonight. Give a big round of applause to our panel.